Good evening. I'm Carolyn Rye, Chair of the School Board. Pursuant to the state of emergency related to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Governor's Executive Orders, the Virginia Freedom of Information Act as amended by the Virginia General Assembly, and the School Board's April 7, 2020 emergency resolution, this special meeting of the School Board of the City of the Virginia Beach will be conducted in person for school board members and certain staff members. However, due to the necessary health mitigation strategies in place, it's impractical and unfeasible for the public to attend the meeting in person. Members of the public will be able to observe the school board meeting through live streaming on vbschools.com, broadcast on VBTV Channel 47, and on Zoom. Copies of the agenda... Uh, and, oh, I'm sorry, I think I, <laughs> I should have started in a different place, but I'll go on here. In accordance with the schedule of school board meetings approved by the school board at the January 12th, 2021 organizational regular meeting and pursuant to bylaw 146, and Virginia Code 2.2-3707, the school board will hold a special meeting on Tuesday, February 16th, 2021 at 5 p.m. in the school board chambers in the school administration building number six at the Municipal Center, 2512 George Mason Drive, Virginia Beach, Virginia 23456. The purpose of this special meeting is for the school board to meet in workshop format to consider the following. One, superintendent's estimate of needs for fiscal year 2021-22, and two, proposed capital improvement program fiscal year 2021-22 through fiscal year 2026-27. Three, a public hearing for citizens to express their views on the proposed superintendent's estimate of needs for fiscal year 2021-22, and the proposed capital improvement program fiscal year 2021-22 through fiscal year 2026-27. With that, we will have a, Madam Clerk, if you would do a, I call this meeting to order and Madam Clerk, if you would proceed with verbal roll call. Thank you, Madam Chair. Present in school board chambers, we have Chairwoman Rye, Ms. Melnick, Ms. Hughes, Ms. Manning, Ms. Riggs, Ms. Owens, and attending via Zoom, Ms. Franklin, Ms. Holtz, Ms. Weems, Ms. Felton, and Ms. Anderson. Thank you. I now uh, ask members to join me for a moment of silence. And please stand as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. That brings us to adoption of the agenda. I do have a motion to amend the agenda. I move that the school board amend the agenda to add an item, an item six update by the superintendent on today's meeting with the Virginia State Superintendent regarding the status of school reopening in Virginia. This update and question and answer discussion will be more than, no more than one hour. Do I have, uh, the chair calls for a second? Mrs. Riggs, any discussion? Okay, hearing none, um, please show your approval with a raised hand. Madam Chair, we do have a unanimous vote. Thank you, Madam, Madam Clerk. The motion passes. Thank you, board members. So we will begin with a presentation, superintendent's estimate of needs. We're going to turn that straight over to Mr. Hunziker.
Uh, good afternoon, Chairwoman, Rye, Vice Chair, Melnick, School Board members, and Dr. Spence. Uh, we're going to move right quickly into uh, Tony's presentation of the CIP. And uh, after uh, we do that, we'll uh, address the uh, questions that we got from the school board. And then uh, there are some other information that I'd like to share with you that's on the agenda <laughs> under other, and then any other discussion that you want to have. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tony Arnold. Thank you, sir. And welcome, Mr. Arnold. Thanks, Farrell. Good evening, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Board of Members, Dr. Spence. All right. Um, what I'm going to do briefly is just uh, go over again um, the presentation that uh, we gave uh, back on uh, the second, just to uh, highlight some of the um, some of the areas of interest in the uh, in the capital improvement program. Uh, and again, um, these are the three projects that are currently uh, either under construction uh, or being programmed. Uh, and or designed, and you can see uh, Prince Anne Middle School, um, our 34th uh, modernization replacement project, uh, $77.2 million is uh, scheduled to open this fall. Uh, we'll start moving furniture and equipment in uh, later this spring. Um, and thankfully, um, even in the, the midst of, um, of what's happened here in the past, uh, past 12 months or so, that the project remains on schedule. Uh, the Plaza Annex, a uh, $13.8 million um, addition to the backside of the um, uh, existing Plaza Annex. Uh, that project, um, actually, the, uh, we're going to start moving furniture and equipment in probably in the next uh, 45 days or so uh, and move in there uh, this summer. Uh, that'll be the first move that our distribution and custodial folks make um, uh, this spring uh, before we move into the, the new Prince Anne Middle School. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, the, the addition to the Lynn Haven Middle School for the Achievable Dream High School program, uh, $12.8 million project. Um, project is, uh, has been programmed. We had a series of uh, design charrettes um, in the, in the uh, late summer and, and into the fall last year. Uh, really, really good charrettes with, uh, with staff and students in the community. Had a lot of, had a lot of students there. Uh, that helped us program that facility. Uh, we should receive 35% uh, construction documents here in the next 30 days, and this project is scheduled to uh, bid this summer and start construction early in the fall. It's a late 22 uh, completion and move in and uh, be ready for a second semester in the 22-23 school year. Uh, uh, you recall ninth graders are, are scheduled to um, enter that building this coming fall, uh, and so we'll be ready for the 10th grade class. Uh, we will support um, the, uh, the ninth grade students uh, this coming year with, uh, we think it's probably going to be four, four portable classrooms that are in the process uh, of being programmed to be moved this spring and summer. Um, uh, more generally, uh, renovations and replacements projects uh, just under 19 million funded in fiscal year 21-22. And again, those are our, what we commonly refer to as our infrastructure projects, re-roofing, HVAC, everything from school grounds, parking lots, uh, you name it, uh, any component uh, or part of a building in the site uh, in our 11 million square feet of space uh, is typically funded through these projects. Um, it's really, it's about $130 million over the six year program. So it's a, it's a really significant investment. Um, it's it's um, not something you see every day. A lot of our maintenance folks and our maintenance services shop handle the day in and day out um, maintenance related items, but these are the big ticket items uh, where we re-roof buildings, replace heating and air conditioning equipment and other large uh, scale capital projects. Another $200,000 uh, this coming fiscal year and, um, and every year to uh, continue to implement um, uh, some of the recommendations associated with the blue ribbon panel for safe schools. Uh, it's been a really good project. Uh, Tommy Demartini and the folks in safe schools are doing a good job um, implementing those recommendations. 
Um, really excited that we've been able to uh, continue with our energy performance contracting. Um, this is phase two. It's uh, $45 million worth. It's ongoing. Um, and some of what you saw um, or you heard from uh, from Brenna Dunn about our greenhouse gas emissions and, and our uh, reducing our um, reducing our footprint and and our overall energy consumption. Uh, we, we've had since our benchmark year of 2006, we've had a cost avoidance on the order of about um, about $70 million. Uh, it's approaching $10 million in, in, in this current fiscal year in cost avoidance. Um, and so a lot of that is attributable to uh, to this project. Um, and you know, another good thing that comes out of this project is it also helps improve the learning environment. You know, uh, we're moving towards all the LED lighting. And so if you go into a building that's 25, 30, 35 years old, uh, and you improve the lighting, not only do you save, um, you save a significant amount of energy and it pays for itself, but improves the overall learning environment. Um, continuing with our elementary school playground equipment, $250,000 a year. Uh, our parks and recreation uh, partners uh, are matching that this year. Uh, it remains to be seen if they if they continue to match it in the in the coming years, but uh, we're doing as many as we can every year partnering with uh, Parks and Recreation. Um, and like I mentioned, the, the Plaza Annex Office Edition uh, that is that is fully funded. Um, again, same project, Achieve a Dream at, middle, at uh, Lynn Haven Middle School, uh, $12.8 million dollar project. Um, uh, probably one of the biggest changes in this capital program, and it's a, a direct result of um, increasing the funding over the six years uh, is that we've been able to fully fund in the superintendent's proposed capital program the replacement of uh, Prince Sand High School. Um, that project, uh, based on what's been proposed, will start programming and design uh, this coming summer um, with a scheduled uh, a schedule to break ground in uh, the summer of 2024 and a projected 2027 opening. So um, if, uh, if you look at last year's program, we had a significant amount of the capital funding outside the six-year window. So it's really difficult to project an opening date uh, for a project of that size when, you, when the project's not fully funded in the six-year window. So that's, that's uh, very, very significant in this program. Um, another sig uh, significant project is the Betty F. Williams Base at sixth grade uh, replacements. Um, both of those uh, um, schools are, are buildings that uh, have long needed to be replaced. Um, this project is also fully funded. Uh, if you go back and look at last year's program, um, we only had three million in years uh, five and six total. So we couldn't have told you when this project was going to open. So uh, this moves this up to a uh, tentative opening date of 2028. Uh, and the first year of funding is in the second fiscal year. So we'll start programming and design um, in another year. So that's very, very significant. And, and uh, finally, uh, in the replacement, the modernization replacement program, um, in keeping with the, the long range uh, facilities master plan that, uh, uh, that was updated uh, in 17, 18, that we brought back to the board in the fall of 2018, uh, funding for um, uh, the replacement of Bayside High School. So there's funding in the outer years, just under 30 million uh, to begin the, the programming and design process. Um, and hopefully be, uh, begin uh, the process for replacing uh, Bayside High School. Uh, we say uh, to be determined for an opening date. Uh, we don't like to put dates out there, but um, potentially as, um, as early as 2033. So that, um, that is a long ways away, but if you look at what, we're, what we will accomplish through this capital program between now and then, uh, really, really huge strides. Uh, compared to what was adopted by council um, in last year's CIP process. Again, uh, the total six-year um, appropriations uh, proposed in the capital program, uh, just under $620 million, including appropriations to date. Uh, and the most important year, year one, uh, $69.8 million. So the funding side of uh, the ledger, um, Really, the, the three most significant um, changes to the funding sources involve uh, the continued use of public facility revenue bonds. You heard Farrell speak to that uh, at the last meeting, uh, $15 million a year in the first four years and $12 million in years five and six. So that's $84 million in the six-year program 
in uh, public facility revenue bonds. It was not in the program last year. Um, uh, phasing in pay go uh, is something that we'd always been uh, planning on doing. You'll see that. Um, uh, the um, continued use of energy uh, performance contracts funding, uh, the years two through six are new. And so you see three million a year uh, in continuing to implement energy performance contracting measures throughout the, the, uh, the division. And then the third, uh, the third big change involves the, the uh, dedication of um, reserve fund balance or, or reversion funds um, at the end of the fiscal year. And so you see that goes from uh, 10 million in 21-22 all the way up to a projected uh, 12 million in year six. So when you, when you look at that across six years, uh, the, average, um, the average funding for six years is uh, right at about $63.5 million. Um, when you compare 69.8 and 21.22, uh, and then to 61.8 uh, and 26.27. So that averages out to $63.5 million over the six-year program. Uh, the, the average of the six fu funding years uh, that was approved last year by council is uh, was 43.2 million over six years. So, uh, really, really significant um, increase in, in capital funding. Uh, one other noteworthy modification: the, the um, and it's footnoted. Uh, you had uh, um, approved the uh, using the proposed sale of the Laskin Road Annex property, which is estimated at 7.5 million dollars to fund the. Uh, the balance of the Achievable Gene Project, um, you uh, since then utilized reversion funds uh, to plug that hole. And so what we've done is we've moved the proposed funding from the uh, LRA sale into fiscal year 21-22. I know this is, uh, you heard Farrell say this last week, it's hard to read. So um, this is... Uh, this sheet and the previous sheet, the funding source side, um, uh, are both in the, the what we call the funding summary tab of your of your CIP book. Um, but these reflect uh, the modifications uh, that were made to uh, the six-year program to balance it against the against the funding sources. Um, and I've I've really highlighted the the most significant changes to uh, to Prince Anne High School being fully funded. Uh, you can see that Prince Anne uh, is funded fully by year four um, and that the Betty F. Williams Bayside sixth grade project uh, begins receiving funding in 22-23 where we'll start programming and is fully funded through year six. Um, those are the two most significant changes. Um, and then uh, the Bayside High School replacement project where you see, um, you see seed money in years five and six to begin the programming and and hopefully design of the replacement of, of Bayside High School. So, Madam Chair, those are um, really from kind of from a high level uh, view, the, the changes to the program. It's a, um, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a lot, a lot of hard work has gone into um, continuing to acknowledge and understand that when you have a, a division of uh, nearly 11 million square feet of space and, and 90 plus buildings uh, that uh, you've got to you've just got to stay at it and so um, the work that we've done with the, the joint modernization committee with school board members and council members had continued to bring awareness to that every year so I think this is the result of, uh, of several years of that work we didn't receive any specific questions from board members on the on the capital improvement program but we would be delighted to to answer any questions that board members may have. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Manning. Um, thank you. Well, first, I'm very pleased to see that we are budgeting more reversion funds into our CIP. Very pleased to see that. A um, couple of quick questions. The Princess Anne High School replacement. Um, are we anticipating swing space for that will be the old Kellum? Yes, ma'am. So we don't really need to budget a lot of money in there for that. Now we um, we uh, are fairly confident that we will uh, swing the Prince Anne High School staff and students into the old Kellum. Um, I say fairly confident in that you can you can uh, likely build a building in the back 
uh, while they remain there. We don't think that is, is the best long-term solution. That'll be part of the programming process. Uh, so there will be, um, yeah, there are some, some special programs, um, some, particularly some special ed programs in the West Wing that uh, we're gonna have, we will have to program how to accommodate them uh, if and when we move them. And so okay. that, uh, you know, you, it's a long-winded answer, but I want to make sure you understand, mm -hmm. like when we moved uh, ODS, uh, uh, the old donation center in Kemp's Landing into the old PA middle, we did some interior build out for dance studios, et cetera. And so we will likely need to do something to the old Kellum to accommodate the entire Prince Anne High School family. Uh, but that is included as, as part of this It's project. included yes, in that. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, so tentative um, opening date, and I know that they're not set in stone, but it's kind of what we're planning for right now of Princess Anne High is 2027, mm -hmm. Bayside 2033. Um, Bayside High School is projected to be $35 million more. Um, what is the large difference in that? Simply inflation. Over five years? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Inflation... Um, uh, inflation generally in uh, capital construction uh, for public schools across the Commonwealth, um, really at every level, and you'll see this when um, when Jack does his his presentation. But inflation over the past twenty years is right at about five percent uh, in capital construction, um, and the, the our data and the Commonwealth's data has has shown that to us. Um, so that's. That's why you, you've heard me say before that for a job of that size, um, every year you wait is six or seven million dollars. So uh, if you go back and look at the, uh, the capital program for the last year, we were able to advance Prince Anne High School by a year, and so we reduced the, uh, the cost of that project by about seven million dollars. Um, because in our, in our industry, time is money. Okay, thanks. I think that's all my questions. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Anderson, or Miss, and then Mrs. Owens. So I know you said um, that the design for Princess Anne High School would uh, probably start this summer. Is that correct? Um, and when do you anticipate they will start construction? Would it be the fa that fall or into the next school year? Or um, no, we uh, <laughs> we would start programming. Um, the, the design charrette and program with the community um, this summer, early fall. Uh, we, we, we wouldn't start construction on site until um, uh, probably the summer of 24. Um, we may uh, and, and would likely have to start if there were tenant improvements that needed to be done or build out in the old Kellum to accommodate Princess Anne, we would probably start that a year in advance. So some of the some of the early construction for the swing space, if it's needed, would would probably start in the summer of 23 or about two years from now, which is um, we were uh, we were concerned we were going to have a building that was this fall is going to be uh, going to be empty the old Kellum and so having that uh, for a long period of time uh, is, can can create some issues so. Um, planning for swing space, uh, we would probably be over there in 23 and then over at Prince Anne uh, on, in uh, summer of 24. Okay. So I, I, would, I was just thinking, um, you know, and, and, and obviously I don't need to think a whole lot about this. You've already done a whole lot of thinking <laughs> as far as getting the old space ready, uh, the old Kellum ready. And, uh, and, and, and you sort of answered my question about, I was really concerned about the special ed program um, at Princess Anne. I know that there are some special specialty rooms uh, available there and specialty equipment. Um, and I, I'm hoping that you've taken all that into consideration. Well, we, we um, you know, that the West Wing was built uh, 33 years ago. It's really, it's hard to believe. Um, and so um, we're, you know, we're gonna we're gonna have to obviously figure out where we're gonna uh, where we're gonna accommodate those um, those students um, while we're uh, while we're building a new building. It was interesting on my on my way here this afternoon. I was uh, coming across Nemo in Holland, and on the old Cal my alma mater where I went to school was 
Princess Anne Middle School. So I was thinking we'd just take down the middle and put up high. You know, be, that's one easy thing. You know, so now you don't have to replace you don't have to replace as many letters. <laughs> Anything to save a little money. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Ms. Owens. There we go. Thank you. Um, I was hoping you could uh, just tell me a little bit more about the Betty F. Williams Bayside 6 project. Is that both uh, buildings are going to be replaced or are they going to be combined? Uh, how is that going to? So I will tell you um, what, the, what the, the program and the estimate and the budget is based on and then what our, uh, what our plans are uh, in about a year and a half. Um, the, the Bayside 6th grade campus is a building that um, is obviously needs to be replaced. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we all would agree with that. And, and really the, the same thing for, for uh, Betty F. Williams. And so this, this project is based on uh, bringing those two schools together in a 4, 5, and 6th grade campus uh, where they would share some core spaces uh, on the Betty F. Williams site. Now that uh, is based on uh, continuing to use the K1, 2, 3, 4, 5 model, mm -hmm. which would include 6th grade. Um, we've never designed and, and uh, program design and built a building that's a 4, 5, 6 building. Right. Um, and so um, I tell people all the time we can design and build anything. Um, but one of the first things that we will do <coughs> when we begin to program that building uh, is do outreach and do analysis over programmatically, physically, uh, all of that, what do we think the right solution is uh, for that community, um, educationally, emotionally? Um, you know, oftentimes uh, the facility side of the house drives things, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the case here where uh, funding for, a, for a, a sorely needed replacement projects will, uh, will drive uh, a conversation over what is the right educational solution for those two campuses. You know, you've probably heard Dr. Spence talk about the number of transitions that those students make from K-1 to 2-3 to 4-5 to 6 to 7-8 to 9 through 12. Uh, so um, that's, that's what we will do. Uh, this project and program and, and budget is based on building a 4-5 uh, six model on the Betty F. Williams campus. Okay. I, um, that, that helps me understand, and I'm sure it'll be a continued conversation yeah, before we that'll be get a, there. So. That'll be a really, really healthy conversation over mm -hmm. what, is the, what is the right, uh, you know, what's the right educational solution? Uh, we're, I'm married to an educator. I'm not an educator, so I, we're, we're operators. We build stuff. Uh, but we build stuff based on uh, programmatic needs uh, and trying to look down the road. What is the what's the best long term solution? You know, because when you're making, uh, you know, a, an investment, uh, any investment, but a capital investment of that size, you know, the buildings that we're building today are, are I call them 100 year buildings. They're going to be here a long time. And we want to make sure that because uh, you know, that's the last building on that campus. Mm -hmm. You know, we we did the whole master plan with Parks and Recreation. We teed up that rec center for the city. Uh, we built those first two buildings. We did the open space. We did the parking lots. We set everything up, and we want to make sure that when we we plan and program the last building on the Williams campus, and we did that whole campus based on knowing <coughs> that we were going to need to get to Williams. So there's space on the site to accommodate that. The good news is that everybody can remain. You know, you know, there's not a need for swing space. Everybody can remain in their existing buildings, okay. uh, uh, whatever type of building we build based on whatever the program needs are. Okay. Thank you, and I think that'll be a just a, a good continued conversation. I'm certainly open to whatever is going to be best educationally, but it, it is interesting that that's the only place in the city where we have sixth graders um, grouped with younger children rather than with older children, and just what implications that may or may not have. So I think that'll be a, a further conversation, but I'm happy to see that we are moving towards uh, getting those buildings replaced, which, like you said, are sorely needed. Thank well, you. It, just to clarify that, and I know it's a longer conversation, but we do have another model. So we have the Lansdowne model. So we do have the Lansdowne Middle School connected to Lansdowne Elementary School with shared space. 
So it isn't, it, it's not without precedent. The, and the idea wouldn't be they're all grouped in the same building, would be two separate campuses with some adjoining space, just like you have in the Lansdale model. Right. So just to, to kind of plant that seed. Okay, for now, Ms. Owens. Okay. Uh, so Mrs. Anderson, oh, oh, we have two who've all, okay. Uh, Any, we're good on Zoom people right now. All right, so back to Mrs. Manning and then Mrs. Anderson. Yeah, so you know that anytime um, we bring up the topic of the Jericho Road Bayside Sixth Grade campus being um, moved and replaced, um, our friends in the Pembroke, Aragona, Bayside communities are going to ask the question, um, what's our plan for that space? Um, what's our plan for that space? We don't have one. Okay. It's my understanding that that land was trusted to us for the purposes of a school and we may had have limited abilities on on what we can do with that correct uh, I would I would have to defer to uh, to our lawyer about um, and I'm, I don't think cam is going to be able to speak to it but the language that was in the uh, uh, when the when the property was dedicated by John Aragona uh, um, and it was you're, you're right it was dedicated at that time for uh, the Aragon Elementary School. Uh, but uh, we don't have any plans right now for what the long-term use of that, uh, of that asset is. Um, you know, that's, that'll be part of the process. Um, you know, if, if we do end up um, moving the sixth graders off-site uh, and, and demolition is, and I do think, I feel pretty I'm pretty confident that ultimately that building will, will be demolished. Um, there are some, uh, with two schools next to each other, some property line issues that are going to need to get resolved between the two campuses. Uh, but I, I really don't, um, I don't know what the long-term use is. It's a, I will tell you this, that we strategically, and I don't think too many board members know this, that there used to be a sewage treatment plant. This was an old clarifier. Uh, uh, sewage treatment plant in the back of the property that the public utilities owned and they tore it down. Um, and um, we strategically asked for it and, uh, and they gave it to us. Uh, and so we own everything back there, including that in the name of the school division all the way back to the water. So it's really, it's a great piece of real estate in, a, in, a, um, in an area of the city that, um, uh, that has a lot of needs. Yeah, I would just like to make sure that if we do start any conversations on that, that we do, the first thing we do is we include um, the neighborhood civic leagues and the, the community surrounding that um, in, in what we're going to end up doing with that. Sure, Thank understood. You. Okay, Mrs. Anderson. Thank You're you. not going to believe this, but that was my exact question. I was going to ask, what are our plans in the future for the, uh, the old Aragona building? So, uh, but I do have another question. Did I miss something? Where exactly are you planning to put the Betty F. Williams Bayside Sixth Grade Campus? Or is, I, I, somehow I thought it was going to be behind where current Betty F. Williams is. Is that correct? It, it'll be um, it'll be somewhere on the campus between the existing Betty F. Williams building and the Newtown building. You know where the where the open space and the fields are. You know if you if you think about how we flipped uh, Windsor Oaks and Windsor Woods where you put the building where the fields are and then come back and tear the building down and flip the fields. It'll, it'll probably, you know, we've got to work through transportation and traffic issues and, and things and drainage, but um, it'll, it'll go probably what I, what I would call behind the building. The so this is not going to be an addition. This is no. going to be, this is going to replace the entire yes, Betty F. Williams building. Okay. Yes, this program is based on, on tearing that building down ultimately. All right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other colleagues? All right, then. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Spence, is there any uh, follow-up comments on the estimate of needs? Yeah, uh, Mr. Hansiker's got some uh, answers to some questions we got from some board members and then a couple of other things to share. Okay. And welcome. Uh, thank you again. Uh, we, uh, and we're showing the, uh, 
the only um, request uh, that we had from a board member, it came from Ms. Manning. And um, you, you can uh, read uh, what's on the slide. Basically, uh, what Ms. Manning asked us to do is to calculate uh, what it would cost if uh, we gave teachers an additional 6%, uh, 3%, which would be a total of 6% instead of 5%, and that we gave everybody else that's on the unified scale 3%. So that's the calculation that we did. So on this slide, we're showing that the cost of what Ms. Manning asked us to do is $27,221,483. That's compared to what the cost is based on in the superintendent's estimate of needs, which is giving everybody the 4.5% COLA and a half a percent step for those that aren't on the top of the scale of 27,846,184. So if the difference in those two numbers is $624,701, which is actually less than the actual cost of a 5% for everyone. So that was the request and that was the response and, and the calculation of, of what uh, we were asked to do. Um, thank you, Farrell. Um, I, I specifically kind of tried to separate out my question. I, I'm, I might just give you a call next time to clarify what I'm looking for a little bit better. Um, I wanted it um, a three. What is the cost for the three percent raise for all employees? And separately, what would be the cost for the additional three percent? So, if you wouldn't mind just breaking that up for me. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I may be able to. Okay. I don't know if I put that in here. I mean, you can give it to me later if you want. Okay. It's okay, uh, a three. Those on the unified scale is six million one hundred ninety five thousand eight hundred and twenty two dollars. So if you do the math. You'd, you'd add another ten million five to the first ten million five, giving teachers a six percent raise. That's twenty one million twenty three thousand seven hundred and seventy eight dollars. You're only giving unified scale employees the three percent, so that would be six million one ninety five eight twenty two, for a total of the twenty seven million uh, two twenty. One four eighty three, or, or, or in that ballpark, and then the, the, you just take the difference between what the original cost for the five percent and what this revised cost is to yeah. get the six hundred and twenty four thousand okay. dollar difference. So when you break out the numbers and do it in like a you're doing four and a half percent cola and a half percent step um, in, in the administration's recommendations, is that calculated the same as if I said I want to give a 5% raise to all employees? No, no, because half of that 5%, half a percent is uh, a step, and not everybody gets a step because there are some people at the top of the scale. Right. They would only get the 4.5% and not the half percent. Gotcha. So it, it's a two-step yep. for that situation. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate that. Um, 
Uh, we have Ms. Franklin and then Ms. Sanderson. I just had a clarification. A follow up to her question. Okay, Ms. Franklin, uh, we'll, we'll put you on hold for just another quick moment. Ms. Manning, were you were you asking about a 3% for everybody except teachers? No, Is I was that asking for 3% for everyone and an additional 3% for te teachers, so a, a total of 6% okay. for teachers. And, right. you know, if, if I'm... I, I'd like to elaborate on this a little bit, but I, I can do it later or I can do it now, Madam Chair, which would you prefer? Elaborate on your recommendation. Well, it's not a recommendation. I mean, your, I mean, your, just, your question. Yes, and then we'll, and then we'll allow. Um, you know, so, so my ultimate goal is I'd really like to see us hitting off some of these, more of these unmet needs here, such as upgrading our bus drivers, um, moving our teacher assistants uh, to grade 10. I mean, I, I would really like to be able to do this. Um, and, you know, we, we talk about we're not competitive in teacher pay, yet that's not what we're really addressing here. We're addressing all pay. And I, I would really like to separate that out and see if we can even do a little bit more for our teachers. Um, and, and again, hit, hit some of these other needs that we have as well. So that was my, my line of thinking, and I think Maybe there's even a little bit more money in here if if we we do the calculations a little bit differently. If you know it's a five and a half percent plus a half step or something like that. So I'd like to throw that out there to my colleagues um, for a conversation. On and you know I'm not set on those numbers, but I was just this was more information gathering for me with these numbers. Okay. Could I um, so so interest so in the interest of clarification. So you were thinking about, in the actually, like the teacher assistants would be put. We talked about putting them on on a the same scale that type. Yeah, that's of, hitting some of those needs. other needs, uh -huh. as well as giving them a three percent. Yes. Okay, I, I'm following you now. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Miss Franklin. Um, I actually find Miss Manning's proposal kind of interesting. Um, can I just ask why the administration is not recommending this, this strategy mm -hmm. at the time? Yes, absolutely. We're going to provide that opportunity. So, Dr. Which okay. of Mr. Hunziker or Dr. Spence? I'll, I'll start. <laughs> I want to remind you of information we've provided for you in the past. We, since 2006, as a, an annual process, have given teachers and other employees the same raise. And, and part of the reason for that, and, and it, it doesn't necessarily go away, is when teachers got uh, the, the, the market and, the, and, 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 and it moved to a, a salary scale, uh, there was a, almost $15, $15 million provided in the budget in 2006 to do that, there was no money provided in that year's budget to address the unified scale inequities. And if you recall, we didn't start addressing the unified scale inequities, I think in 2009 or 2010, and it took us seven years to make all that equity up. So I think we, we got there in 20. 17 and so it so that the unified people would be pretty much at the marketplace rates and so that's one of the reasons why we wanted to continue because every year that you show a differential to one group or another that group falls behind the market mm -hmm. so that's that's one of the reasons that we wanted to make sure that we continued what was our process and to give every employee um, a raise. There are a number, and I don't know, John, you're here. There are a number of employee categories that are below the market, just like teachers, John. So, so a, a caution to, to consider if the uh, board decides to go in that direction. 
we couldn't, we had trouble promoting assistant principals from the classroom. And so when you say teachers, you're talking about pretty much all the instructional folks. And it's a very delicate balance be between each, it's, it, they're not, I know you see some salaries sometimes after years and years, but the truth is when we were trying to promote folks prior to what Farrell's talking about, the equity adjustments for the unified, we, we couldn't, we were hiring assistant principals out of the classroom, coming out, a teacher coming out of the classroom. They were adding two months to their schedule and it was, we couldn't do, it was horrible. Also, trying to hire from outside the division, administrators, not good. So I, I do worry, I, I understand the thought behind it, but understand the, there is a ripple effect uh, with these salary schedules and how they operate in, in between the different jobs. I mean, it, it's, it's uh, I, I know conceptually it might make sense, but I'll tell you, the division over the years did that several times, and it, it was just very difficult to start saying, oh, and in fact, I'll tell you, when I became an assistant principal, one of my friends who used to be on the board, she probably wouldn't mind me saying it uh, at, at some point, but she actually took a $3,000 pay cut to become an assistant principal. So when I hear the concept, I, I, I'm glad I had an opportunity to share that with you. It is a ripple effect. So we got to be very careful if we start thinking about that. That's in, in addition, if you do this, if you do, you have social workers, you have psychologists, you have guidance counselors, you have across the board, you have trades positions. You can, we can hardly get a qualified bookkeeper at the middle school and the high school because they're below market. So those are just some examples of, of making that gap even wider and there is no way we can hire the, the best qualified employee if we're unable to meet the market rates. It's just not going to happen. And, and I think just as, an, as sort of a layer there, you, you want to think about, as a board, and why we wouldn't recommend it, also the message you send, right? Because this is part of that. So if you're telling your maintenance and trade staff, you, you have a different value to us than teachers. If you tell your custodial staff the same thing, now I understand in this instance we're moving them up a pay grade. But if that was, you know, a precedent down the road and we weren't moving them up a pay grade and they were getting a 3% raise and not that. But your bus drivers, for example, you're not moving up a pay grade. You're going to tell them they're not valued in the same way. You're going to have the same conversation with the other work groups that Mr. Hondrick was talking about and certainly the admin. And then for us, what that does is... If you think about we're always hiring and we're always trying to recruit from other school divisions and across the region, um, as well as we're trying to recruit from inside the city, if I'm sitting in Chesapeake and I understand that might help us with teachers, to be honest with you, but it might not help us with other thing, other areas that we're trying to hire for. Where somebody says, well, I go over there, the teachers are going to make more than me and they're going to get paid differently than me that can create some problems. So it's just, you have to think about, those are sort of some of the ripple effects that Mr. Mayor is talking about and why we don't recommend that as a strategy. Although again, conceptually, if you said, okay, well, we're gonna do a 3% more for, for the instructional scale, but for everybody else, we're gonna do pay grade increases and you did that across the board, that's different. But you're talking about a, a very small number of left unmet needs because we did tackle a number of them as i pointed out before in this budget right with the custodial pay grade increase with the adjustments for the school counselor so there are a couple of different ones that we did tackle uh in this budget as well so mrs franklin i hope that speaks specifically to uh, why we don't necessarily recommend that strategy and I will... uh, that's helpful i would like to uh, I, i'm sorry Mr. Hester, uh, I would like to maybe get a little bit more in depth, and it's probably just my sheer ignorance from just being new on the board. But I, I have a few more questions that I'm, but I'm going to uh, do a little research first. Thank you. I would just add that, and you, you got a um, ten-year report from the uh, Virginia Beach Teacher uh, Educational BBA 
the president of BBA. And uh, we've been doing some research to what they sent you. And Mr. Hunsaker, just step up to the mic for the purpose of the Zoom people. We, Thank you. We will, uh, 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 and, and John and his staff and part of my staff, we've been looking at that since last week. And we will provide a response. But one of the responses that I want to share with you is uh, uh, where uh, in one of the slides it shows it, the, the whole uh, premise is that Virginia Beach teachers are well beyond the, the state average teacher. Go back to the superintendent's estimate need presentation. There is a chart in that presentation that shows you that the state of Virginia teachers are 32nd out of 50 states in teacher pay. Mm -hmm. If you take out Northern Virginia school districts, mm -hmm. the Virginia teachers average drops to the bottom five of 50 states, or they're 45th or 46th. Mm -hmm. So if you did that here, with the information that the VBA shared and you took out the Northern Virginia, Virginia Beach teachers would be in the top percent of the rest of the school districts in the state. So we're not way down here, uh, way low when you compare us with other districts in the state if you don't consider the Northern Virginia teachers who are paid much more in Northern Virginia than we are here. And that's just a, another point I'd like to make. Mrs. Malnick. And so as, as a board, um, I think we, we are doing everything that we can. And I think it's important to note that until we nationally start to recognize and value teachers, um, that this isn't really going to change and that states really need to be addressing not only the teacher shortage, but um, teacher wage increases. And that's got to start happening, happening in, in the Commonwealth and, and it needs to start happening across this nation. And so what gives me a little pause is, uh, so certainly in the midst of this pandemic, there's, there's more reasons than ever to pay teachers more, right? But by the same token, in the midst of this pandemic, I think it's raised everybody's awareness and appreciation for our support staff. And I, I, I just would hesitate to, the, to use this timing for it, uh, a disparity in, in, comp, in raises. Uh, Again, because so I guess it's it's a, a little twist on what Dr. Spence shared, but just for me personally, why I would struggle with that. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Manning. Yeah. So, Mr. Hunsaker and Mr. Mayor, I I I completely understand where you're coming from. I understand the um, the issues that the district has had in the past. I just look at it a little bit differently. And one of the first questions I asked a couple of weeks ago is, are we having trouble? Are, are, we, um, are we having trouble in different areas, such as the trades? Um, and that's why I asked that question initially. Um, and year round, all I hear is, we are underpaying our teachers. I never, ever hear we're underpaying any of our other employees or we're having trouble hiring our other, uh, our other employees. All I hear year round is we're underpaying our teachers. So if, if, if that's not the right message, then perhaps we need to start, start change our messaging. Maybe our messaging should be we're underpaying our employees if that's what it is. But something I'd like to point out, I mean, we offer a lot of benefits that the civilian workforce doesn't, the non-governmental um, workforce doesn't for our, our trades folks are a lot of our a lot of our folks most people in the in the non-governmental world don't get retirement benefits they don't get the medical benefits that we have here all of the additional benefits so that is a benefit of just being an employee of our division um, and 
in doing this, part of, in, and Dr. Spence kind of addressed it already, where we're moving up our custodians. I want to move up and address some of these um, these issues that we have for our clerical staff and our bus drivers and our teacher's assistants and, and advanced degrees. And to me, priority-wise, that's more important than creating a few inequities on the pay scale. Out in the civilian world, people in the same company doing the same jobs are getting paid different wages. That's just how it is. So if there's some inequity in, in if a 30-year teacher is making more than an assistant principal, but we're still able to hire an assistant principal, then I'm okay with that. Um, if we get to the point where we just can't hire an assistant principal, then okay, maybe we need to look at, at improving that rate. But I, I still would like for us to consider thinking outside the box, especially right now, like Ms. Melnick said, let's address, uh, address the, the, the teacher wages. And this is one way that we can do it. Yes. Um, I just wanted to know um, if Mrs. Franklin would like to be put back in the queue. Her hand is up. Mrs. Franklin, just a question on if you had a follow-up. Uh, yes, I do, actually. Okay, I'll put you back in. Okay. All, All right. right. So that'll be after Mrs. Anderson. So <clears throat> following along this conversation... I understand, and I see your point of view, Mr. Hansiger, that, you know, that we also have to address the needs of other staff as well. I get that. But one of the things that we talked about was addressing our teacher assistants, putting, I believe it was putting them all together in the same, Mr. Mr. Mirror, is that right? That's putting, correct. It's Even though some need. of them will be paid more than others because of experience, correct? Could you address that just a little bit? No, it would, we, it would, we would include equity adjustments, correct, in that amount. Okay. And so we would move them all up to grade U10 and then include equity adjustments in the amount that we've listed in the unmet needs. So that would get them adjusted based on their level of experience. Right. What I'm having trouble following here, though, is that, as Mrs. Manning pointed out, we constantly talk about we need to bring up teacher pay, we need to bring up teacher pay, and we hear it all the time. If we're ever going to be able to pay our teachers and bring the teacher salaries up, because when we, when we hear about teacher salaries, we don't take into consideration the janitors and the secretaries and the bookkeepers and they just look at teacher pay. And so as much as I, I see your point of view as well, but, but we're never going to be able to raise teacher pay to the point of addressing the need to bring their teacher salaries up to the national scale if we always have to consider everybody else as a part of our system. I realize we can't do our jobs without our support staff. I get that. This school system won't run without the support staff. But at the same time, there, I think sometime in the future, we're going to have to address a targeted raise just for teachers. I know that some of my colleagues may not, may not agree with this, but she's right, Mrs. Manning is right. We always talk about teacher pay. And so there come there is going to come a time where we're going to have to say we have to target teacher pay. And 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 yes, that may that may encompass everyone who touches children, for example, um I mean I mean like the counselors, the psychologists. I, I kind of lump them together because if they work for our school system, they're really considered teachers, even though I know they're psychologists and counselors. I get that. But, you know, all I can say is that, you know, I know that when the General Assembly works on giving pay raises, they target teachers. They target the SOLs. They target the SOQ positions. SOQ positions, excuse me. That's right. But the SOQ those, positions. Because those are state-funded positions. Right. The SOQ positions are primarily teachers, when you think about it. 
That's what they. That's what they're targeting. No, they they include support positions as well that are all included in that support cap that we talk a lot about. Right. So there are a lot of positions that are included in the SOQs, and those okay. are what the state has determined it will fund. School divisions then get local funding for other positions. And so with that's they don't, but they don't say a teacher raise. Now it gets reported as a teacher raise, but it's an SOQ position raise. It's a state funded position raise. Okay. And and I would I would just push back a little bit on this. We only hear about teachers because in my time here, we've had bus drivers stand in front of us and talk about their pay. Mm -hmm. We've had counselors stand in front of us and talk about their pay. We've heard custodial um, team members come and talk about their pay. We've had folks from the maintenance shop talk about their pay, talk about retirement concerns. Mm -hmm. Now, if you say that the Education Association talks about teacher pay, I'll agree with you because that's who we hear from. And they come and they talk about specifically teacher pay and they line up teachers to come and talk about teacher pay. My job, your job, I'm going to remind us is to represent all of the employees in our in our organization. At least that's what I believe my job is, is again, why I'm not going to recommend that strategy. But ultimately, it's, you, it's your decision. And I realize uh, it could free up some dollars. We, we pointed to that, and you're right. There could be a few hundred thousand dollars more in there if you did a, a half a percent and then and then a, a five and a half percent raise for teachers. But that isn't going to come near the five million dollars to move teacher assistance up. You're not going to tackle that that way. So it, it isn't going to really, I mean, you might be able to, uh, get to upgrading the bus drivers. I'll remind you, we did that recently. Right. So you might not want to make that your priority. You might look at clerical positions, so you might be able to get to that one, and you'd have to pick one of those. And again, I think one of my responsibilities has to be to advocate for the other people in the organization who are doing good work to support us. And we do have to remain competitive in that market. So we may not have problems hiring those people now, but if you start telling those people we're not going to pay you and give you pay raises at the same rate as every other employee in the organization, you may find out quickly you can't hire those people. And, of course, one of the distinguishing factors in terms of who's available to hire is who's available to hire. One of the reasons we have a teacher shortage is not just because of pay. It's because we have a teacher shortage. Mm -hmm. we've, we've shown you those charts. We've shown you the graph of the declining enrollment in teacher prep programs and the increasing demand for teachers. And, and so, you know, when we talk about, there's a lot of nuance here. And so I just wanna, I, I kinda, I wanna make sure we, we at least look at the whole picture as we think about that. And I'm not saying that idea doesn't have, doesn't make sense conceptually. I'm just saying there's a lot of, as Mr. Mira said, uh, ripple effects that I would be concerned about representing all of the other folks in the organization who aren't on that teacher scale. I just feel like we're in a bit of a quandary though, because, are we ever going to be able to raise teacher pay to the point where we're we're competing with the, with the state average or, or with the national average is what we're trying to we're trying to hit? So, are we ever going to be competitive with so, the national so average? So let me talk about the state average. Let me talk about the national average separate from the state average. The state average is based on localities' ability to pay. So you have Northern Virginia localities with substantive, substantively higher tax rates because their cost of living is higher, because their houses cost a lot more. If you've ever looked at the housing costs in like in Arlington or in Alexandria, you'll know what I'm talking about. You can get a ranch for a million and a half. So that's their tax base. And because that's their tax base, they pay more. They pay more to be able to entice and attract teachers to live up there where it's incredibly expensive to live. That's why we always talk about Northern Virginia is a little bit different than the rest of the state. It's different than our region. That's why we say when we look, we ought to be looking to be competitive in our region. When you, when you take out, as Mr. Hunter talked about, if you take out the Northern Virginia counties and cities and you only look at outside of that, Virginia Beach rises to the top 10% in terms of pay. And so we, maybe we, then we could look at, okay, how do you get to the top 10% and how do you get to the top? in Virginia, outside of the Northern Virginia localities, if that's a goal? Or how do you make sure you're consistently at the top in the Hampton Roads region if that's a goal? That's why I said we, we probably should have some conversation about philosophy of, of compensation, perhaps at our next uh, retreat, as we, we discussed in the last meeting. The, the issue, though, that when we talk about national, so let's talk about national average. Why is the state average so far below the national average? That is a state funding formula problem. That is not about individual localities' ability to pay, right? That is about 
where does the funding come from and at what percentage does it come? So we know right now more than 50% of our compensation of our funding, excuse me, of our funding comes from the locality. More than 50%. That has flipped over on its head in the last decade. We know that the state has not given significant raises in the last decade. We're, we're seeing some movement now in the current budgets that are now out uh, on this topic for this General Assembly. We have to see what that means in the calc tools because there's a required matching component and, and it's over the biennium, but we'll get the calc tools on that and we'll let you know what that looks like. Those should be out by the end of the week. So when you, when you consider if you want to affect national average, what we, need to be, what we need to be doing is talking to our state about real raises for SOQ funded positions. And then we need to find a way to keep up with those with local match and make sure that the rest of our employees also are able to receive competitive compensation increases so that they can, we can stay competitive in the market for everybody that we need to hire to keep our school division moving forward. But I'm going to argue till I'm blue in the face that this is a state problem, not a local problem. I've said it since I got here. Our city has been great about taking care of its local share of this. That, that's why they now have more than 50% of our local revenue. But we need to make sure that the state does its job because the state has a constitutional obligation to fund education at, at what's required to operate school systems. And so we do re-benchmarking. That money needs to come in, but often that money comes in and that's all that comes in. And that doesn't include anything to do with compensation increases. It's just re-benchmarking the cost of where we are today. So there's a lot more advocacy that needs to happen there when we talk. So it's just, and I'm, I'm going now down a bit of a road and I apologize, but I just want to distinguish between state average and national average and why those things exist and where the funding mechanisms that have the greatest impact uh, exist to, to, to make changes in those averages. Thank you. All right, Mrs. Riggs and then Mrs. Franklin. Well, personally, I think if we're going to do anything for, for teachers and, and see them um, get the raises and get what, what they should be getting, we need to look at our pay scale. I mean, I, I remember when we had one, and I knew that I'd be getting that, that raise. And that, that pay scale every five years or however the, the increment was. It's time for us to look at that and look at it seriously. Talk about philosophies. I think that's one that we really need to look at. It's time to do that. And uh, that's something that I'm asking to do very seriously when we come to our um, Just our for clarification, year. I assume you're talking about the experience step increase? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. yeah. and I think one that great, makes a difference. Well, and I think that's a great conversation to have, and I think it is one we should have at the retreat. And as you think about that, I think you should also need to remember, whatever you make it, the board has to come through on, mm -hmm. and ha the money has to be there to do it. So we could make it a 10% step increase every year. That'd be great, but the board would have to have 10% every year to do that. And so that's why coming out of the recession, when we finally started to see new revenue, Mr. Hansiker and Mr. Mirror and I got together and said, what can we put on, on the docket for an experience step increase that we felt, at least for the current revenue projections, we could really look to the board and say, we think you can do this over the course of the next several years. Now, this summer at the retreat, I think a perfect time to look at the revenue forecasts, look at this projection, say, is it time to increase that from 0.5 to something else and have a conversation about what that looks like? Right. Yes, that's, that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Franklin. Well, gosh, we've had so many great comments. Um, so first of all, I do actually agree with um, Dr. Spence that, you know, the reason that the teachers pay in Northern Virginia is much higher is because I, I can guarantee you, because I have clients in Northern Virginia, that it is incredibly different to have um, to be able to live there, and you know, I, I've heard so many complaints since I've been on the board about you know, how, and how can teachers in Virginia Beach actually afford to live in Virginia Beach? And and it is it, it is a vicious cycle because, again, it, yes, we want to pay them more, but we also I do agree with Dr. Spence that we do have to keep in mind that 
is because they are taxed so much higher in Northern Virginia. So, so again, coming from kind of a banking background, I, I totally agree that we have to look at this with some fiscal responsibility as well. However, I also agree with some other comments that uh, Ms. Manning and um, Ms. Riggs and uh, Ms. Anderson had, had been talking about. And so I, I absolutely agree with, with Ms. Manning's um, comments about some of the, the jobs that we hire in Virginia Beach. You know, I, again, coming from a military background, I can tell you the only reason, because, you know, being in the military is not always wonderful, um, but part of the reason that you go ahead and you stay in, in, in that military lifestyle is because of the benefits that you in the future will have or that you currently have, such as the housing allowance and, and some of the other allowances that, that they provide to you. Um, so I do agree that there is some benefit to being um, a, a, a city employee as well, and we have to kind of account for that when we're talking about compensation packages. So, and, and I hate to ask you this, but because I am new, I would, and I, I know that I've emailed a few of you as well, um, I would like to kind of take an in-depth look at, you know, what do we look at, or what is the actual value of that compensation package um, when it when when it comes to some of the other um, areas where you know we have to look at you know Miss um, Manning said a civilian job uh, you know when we're looking at the private sector how we are not pacing perhaps but then we bring in the compensation piece um, the package when it comes to health benefits the fact that you know a lot of our jobs were, um, were were protected during this pandemic, and you know maybe not so much in the in the private sector. So I really want to start weighing some of those things in there because if, if we're really looking at competition and being competitive, we have to weigh all of that because you know to be honest with you, it'd be very difficult to entice a young person to join the military um, a lot of times and, and deal with boot camp and all those other things unless you've actually provided them a steady income and some other benefits that they have, health insurance, all those type of things. Um, so, you know, so there is a reason when you're trying to, to entice people to come to those positions. It's not always just about the pay. It is also about the compensation package, which I think we have to take into, into mind when we're looking at all of this. So I don't know if there's a way to... Um, to actually put a, a true dollar amount on that compensation piece um, or not, but I, I'm just curious if there is. Well, well, I mean, there is, and actually our employees have an annual compensation statement that includes their health and benefits as long, along with their base salary. So we actually do put a dollar amount to that. Um, the, the question you, would be... Again, I apologize for my ignorance if there is. If there is. I just no. trying to figure all this out. So. What, what, we, what we don't have and it's, what we aren't able to do in a timely fashion, it will take time <laughs> beyond March the 2nd when you have to adopt the budget, is we, we don't have the private sector information. Correct. We don't have other employers' information. That would be a that's a study that we would have to make to do that, and we can do that. It's just not going to be, it's not feasible that we could do that between now and when this budget has to be adopted. However, every employee has a statement that shows what their compensation is and then what their other benefits. Their other benefits are VRS, is Social Security, it's a health insurance that the employer pays, uh, and there are other additional benefits that employees get. That's all a part of what's in that statement that employees get. Well. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious what, what that is in a, in a number, in a dollar amount. Mm -hmm. and, and in your in that conversation, are you all looking for, you, Ms. Franklin, in particular, or the board in general, a work group by work group comparison of compensation plus benefits in the private sector versus the government sector? I mean, or are you looking for specific work groups? I mean, the one we... we, we talk about a little bit is the the other because the other part you want to look at past that is is the pay gap right so the difference between compensation as a base salary conversation and then adding in those benefits to see if there's a difference you know so if you looked at like we we showed in the estimate of needs conversation that virginia is dead last in terms of pay gap so we have the largest gap between average income in the state and then average salary for teachers we have the largest 
gap between te- uh, educators who have you know teachers with a bachelor's degree and anybody else in the state with a bachelor's degree. So there's a couple of ways to look at that pay gap. Um, and I, and then I guess the the question that's being posed is does the do the benefits package make up for that? Um, and and then there and and then are you looking at that across all of the different work groups or how how did you how did you envision looking at that? I'm, I'm sorry. Are you are you asking me? Right yes, ma'am. You or or the board writ large. I mean, before we go, start trying to study that and get answers to that. Are we looking at every individual work group and trying to come up with that? It's also well, difficult I, because, I you know, how do you... Know, um, in the areas where we are having, where we're struggling, um, either maintaining or hiring, I would be just curious what, you know, I, what kind of strategy we're, we're looking at when it comes to, you know, because I personally, again, coming from a military background, I personally don't think that it, it is just about pay. There are a lot of people in the military that are underpaid, but then, you know, when you weigh in the benefits, that makes up for a lot of it. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to just keep focus on pay because I think that the benefits absolutely have to weigh in on the conversation as well. Yeah, and I agree. I, I would I would caution against a military comparison only because there is not your health care is not paid for by our by the district. Your your health care comes with a premium that you pay on a monthly basis, we pay for part of that. Uh, we we do a review. We do a review of that. Please forgive me. I'm just using the military as my personal. Um, right. No, I understand. In terms of you know, uh, you know, trying to weigh in um, some of my my viewpoints, my comments. I, I'm just trying to say that benefits matter. Um, I think at a big scale. It, you know, certainly not you're trying to compare the military to this. I'm just saying that that is my background. And I know for me personally that having the benefits made a difference in my decision to just, you know, retire from the military. So I'm just trying to, and I absolutely know that we do not have the same type of benefits. I'm just saying what is the, the actual um, perception of the benefits package, you know, for the, you know, for BBCPS. Well, we will uh, perhaps try to to pin that down a little bit more as we go forward. It, I mean, we can't compare teachers to another comparable group in the private sector because it doesn't exist. I mean, there isn't like a teacher group in the private sector. For the most part, we could look at private schools, but I'll tell you, they get paid less um, than public school teachers in general. Um, the... But, you know, then there's nuances to that as well. So then it, it's a challenging question if you want to look at pay, group by group. If we want to do broad comparisons to average salaries in in uh, different industries and then look at our industry, we can try to accomplish that. Um, and then we do do market analyses on different work groups. We talked about, for example, at our last meeting, analysis on clerical uh, positions and and how they compared in the marketplace. Uh, we've done similar analyses uh, for other work groups in the past, and we certainly can provide some of that information. Um, but the most recent one we have is the clerical study. And, and Ms. Franklin, this, this is uh, Farrell. Uh, we we just don't have the time to do what you're asking us to do in this budget cycle. We can certainly do a study. And it will take some time, and that could be shared at maybe the board's retreat in the summer. Uh, but we, we don't. Fine, yeah. I, I absolutely. I, <laughs> you know, we're just talking, having this discussion right now, just because I think people are interested in weighing in. And I, you know, I just am just throwing the question out there, as as you know, as Manny was, and um, you know, I, I we're you know, I'm just general, genuinely interested in knowing what the compensation piece um, in terms of the benefits um, adds to, um, you know, someone's complaint as well. So um, it, it doesn't have to be for me right now. I, and, and if it's not before this, um, you know, this budget cycle, I understand. I just, I, I would just be interested, I guess is all I'm saying. And, and I think, as Dr. Spence alluded, that we, we can certainly do that. It, it's just going to take a little time to do it because we want to do it right. And if we're trying to compare ourselves to 
different kinds of industries in the private sector or other, we, we want, it's going to take some time to get that information. These folks just don't automatically, we call them on the phone and, and we can immediately get answers. It, it, it takes a lot of time to pull that kind of information together. We're, we're happy to do it. It's just going to take us a little time. So I will note what we're already aware of, but that next week is our next opportunity to discuss this. And I would think at that point we owe the the administration some idea of where this board stands on on this one this specific proposal. Miss Rye was going to yes, say, sir. really, at this point in time, next week, we need to have a really a final budget because it's going to take us time to whatever decisions you make next week we've got to do the analysis run the numbers uh, have that all ready for the meeting on i think it's march the second when you have to approve the budget <laughs> we can't be making those calculations on march the second as you know we have the city staff waiting for us uh, as soon as you finish uh, the, the approval of the budget, it, it takes us about a week to pull all the numbers that we have to give them together. So uh, I would urge you to use next week as a goal of having uh, the information we need for final decisions on the budget recommendations. Uh, and, and I do have a little information that I can share with you that relates to possibility the possibility of having other information between now and next week but i want to make sure we get through the this subject before i do that it's in in the, in the agenda under other are you proposed do you have something now to share further i would say go ahead <laughs> well i'll share this uh the state budget uh is now at the conference committee level meaning that the Senate and the House have finished their approved, uh, proposed budgets, which means that then they go to a conference committee. Each of the House and the Senate will have representatives on this committee. They will negotiate then what will be a final budget proposal. So, so that's where we are. We're at the conference committee level with the House and the Senate negotiating what the final budget will be. Interesting, we do know that in the Senate budget, they're proposing a 3% raise, not, not a bonus, which the uh, governor's was a 2% bonus, but the Senate's proposing a 3% raise. The House is proposing a 5% raise. Now for schools, as Dr. Spence has said, that would be for those SOQ positions so it's not for every employee in Virginia Beach. So we'll have to see where that goes. I, I think it's good news. The, the second thing is that yesterday uh, the governor sent a letter to the General Assembly um, money committees uh, and announcing that a final mid-year Revenue analysis shows that the Virginia tax revenues continue to strengthen, indicating total revenue and transfers will be revised upward statewide by $410.1 million. So that's not money that was in the governor's budget. That's not money that was being considered in the House budget or the Senate budget. So hopefully that's good news that maybe school divisions will get some part of that, how it would come to us and, and, and what it would be recommended, we don't know. But I just think it's good news that a 3% to a 5%, an additional $410 million at the state level, it, it has to be pretty good news to, to school divisions. And that's just all I had to share. And, and Farrell, that that three and the, the Senate and House figures uh, is that just teachers, or, or you said it's SAQ? Or it's SOQ. You did say that. Thank you. Okay. And uh, that's all we have on the agenda. All the information and the presentations, and it's now up <laughs> to to the board. If you have any other further discussions or whatever. Okay, um, Mrs. We have Mrs. Felton with us now. Mm 
Mrs. Felton, go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Uh, like Ms. Franklin said, we had a lot of uh, robust conversation. And um, I would hope that my colleagues would still consider, I'm not saying that you're completely wiping out the custodians, the bus drivers, and all the unmet. I hope that we still consider those. When I came on board uh, as a school board member, it might not have been said about a, um, a raise, but we've had a deficit with bus drivers, custodials, cafeteria workers throughout my whole reign on the school board. And when you have a deficit or they aren't there, that means either the, the pay isn't good or something isn't going quite right with those departments. I hope that we will still, can still consider those group, that group of individuals for a pay raise. Um, I've had a lot of conversation with bus drivers, custodials, cafeteria workers, and all the other staff below the teachers as well about a raise. Um, whether or not, and I, I, whether or not their compensation package is equitable to the teachers either, I would like to know that as well. I'm just making a statement, and I, I look forward to talking in our retreat about the compensation pay, uh, pay scale and also the inflation scale with our workers. But I would um, ask that we don't just consider our support group. They are a support group. And they help to make our educational environment uh, a learning environment for our students and teachers as well. Uh, before, and I'll repeat again, before the COVID hit, COVID hit, we had a deficit in all of these. And I do believe it was reported in 2020 at the end, right in December, and we had over 300 positions open for uh, custodians. So while we're making our decision, I would ask my colleagues, and I'm not saying that you're not considering them, but just be cautious as we move forward with this process and the raise. And I do agree, I, I do agree with, with what Mr. Merrill said uh, and Mr. Hunsinkle has said about if we keep pushing into the back burner, we're gonna go further behind. Nationally, yeah. since this COVID has hit nationally, the pay gap between these individuals who works in these positions has widened substantially. So I know how it's, it, it could be hitting us as well. So just for consideration, well, I want to make sure that we keep these individuals, we are, employed, we are a school board member for them as well, to keep them also in the front. Thank you so much. Okay. Ms. Owens and then Mrs. Manning. And I won't um, be long, but I, I again, I, I appreciate uh, Ms. Manning bringing up uh, the topic of the need for us to continue to explore other ways to look at our compensation. And um, I'm looking forward to a, a robust conversation uh, during our next retreat. Uh, when we talked about the uh, comparisons, uh, personally, I think we need to be more focused on comparisons, uh, pay-wise and compensation-wise with local districts and other governmental um, bodies rather than the civilian uh, counterparts, I think it's important for um, consideration that, and I can't speak so much for, for teachers, but I'm thinking that our, our main competition is going to be other school districts, other governmental uh, agencies. Our school social workers, we're not losing them to private practice social work if they're moving around, they're going to the city, they're going to the state. They're, once you get into the VRS uh, retirement system a certain amount of years, when we're losing them, we're losing them to other agencies that pay into VRS. And so I think that's where we need to be focusing on being competitive. Um, and maybe there's a way that we can see if we are losing more of our employees to uh, private sector or to other agencies that are keeping them in the VRS so that we're being able to, to focus where we need to be competitive instead of just generally being competitive um, to, to places that we may not be losing our employees to. 
that it? Okay, Mrs. Manning and then Mrs. Anderson. Yeah, I just want to clarify to Ms. Felton and my, you know, the the specifics that I've been asking about. I've never asked to um, take away that custodian pay grade um, that we already have included. Um, moving the custodians up a pay grade. I support that, and that's already in the budget. I'm not suggesting that we take that out. Um, and I, I just, so one quick question, uh, Mr. Hansiker, the proposals of the state legislature for the pay raises, um, would that offset the costs that we're proposing, or would that be for a future year? It, it's hard to say. We, we wouldn't know until we get what's called a calc tool. Okay. We won't get that until they reach a compromise. Uh, but if it's more money, if it's more funding for the SOQ, we have to pay a local match. Right. So it, I can't speculate whether or not the net would be additional money or the local match plus this would, would balance out. We just have to wait until... And we're we, not going to know that by March 2nd, correct? I, it's... They're in a compromise committee right now negotiating. I just don't know. Dr. Spence, do you have a feel? No, I, don't, I don't have a sense that we'll know that by then. Okay. I, I would just like for the board to consider a, a slightly lower COLA and step increase for all employees um, so that we can um, attack these unmet needs, such as increased allowance for um, advanced degrees, moving the teacher assistants up to grade U10, upgrading our bus drivers, our clerical positions, um, the additional duty supplements, which was top on my list <laughs> um, with all of this. That's very important to me. Um, I would really like for the board to consider um, tackling more of these unmet needs um, by reducing the total COLA and step increase. And happy to have that conversation with anybody um, that wants to discuss it. Um, Mrs. Anderson. Well, it's it's it, I know it's premature, and we probably won't know how much extra money. But if the state does provide more money than <clears throat> what we're anticipating. Um, would it be possible then, and, and you may not be able to answer that, to tackle some of these unmet needs with the additional money that, that we may get from the state? That, But, you know, it's, 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 it's a question that I may probably shouldn't even ask, ask right now because we'll have to come back if we get additional funds, and then, we, then we'll decide, I think, at that point uh, what we do with those additional funds. We well, usually do come back later on anyway, correct? Yeah, once you adopt the budget on March the 2nd, <laughs> anything that, if we don't have the legislative final budget, however it differs between what you approve and after the fact what the actual bill, budget bill is that's approved, we would have to come back. We, 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 we've done that in previous years. Right. Typically, we come back between March and before May the 15th <laughs> when the city has to adopt the budget ordinance. So, so yes. Right. But remember, if the state is giving us additional money, it's telling us how we should use it. Right. So it may, it may not give us the flexibility of how we want to use those extra funds, if we okay. get any extra funds. It's just, just a caution. It, okay. We just have to wait and see what the final budget is and, and run it through that state calc tool so we know precisely what our options are, et cetera. But right. we certainly can amend the budget after the March 2nd when you have to approve it. Uh, I, I, I'm hoping that it will be good to be able to amend the budget uh, with extra money. That's what I'm hoping for, but, you know, I realize we've done it in the past and we certainly can do it again. Thank you. And then um, the legislative committee's job will be to see what bills were passed that, that may also ta tag on some unfunded mandates for us because I know of at least one that may have passed that, that's going to add to our ever-growing list of unfunded mandates that some of our legislators don't think about when when proposing some of these uh, these laws, these bills. 
one of the bills that we know of, uh, and I think it may, it made uh, it through, is to provide additional support positions. Mm -hmm. I think it was three for every thousand students. Uh, our rough calculation on, on that is we would have to add 10, uh, quote, professional positions uh, to what we already have and those will come at a cost of over a million dollars. So that, that's an example of we, we get additional money from the state, but then it's gonna cost us money to, to implement it. Okay, so uh, Dr. Spence, any final thoughts before we wrap up this session? No, ma'am, just a reminder between now and next week, if you've got questions, Please send them to us. We'll do our very best to get them answered um, by, by next Tuesday. All right. And you all keep in mind Ms. Manning's offer, too, to reach out to her. Okay. Now that brings us to the public hearing portion of the agenda. Public hearing for citizens to express their views on the proposed superintendent's estimate of needs for the fiscal year previous, uh, this fiscal year of 20 upcoming of 21-22 and the proposed capital improvement program for the fiscal year 21-22 through fiscal year 26-27. Madam Speaker, do we have, Madam Clerk, do we have any speakers? <laughs> Madam Chair, we do not have any speakers this evening. Thank you. So now that brings us to our uh, agenda add-on and I'll, I'll repeat here. Uh, this is now the uh, superintendent will be uh, sharing with us uh, his meeting. I guess it was a phone conference meeting today with the Virginia State Superintendent regarding the status of school reopening in Virginia. So, Dr. Spence. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I thought what I would do is uh, start with just a quick overview of what the guidance says writ large we're still absorbing it it came out just to be clear what we're talking about the cdc issued new guidance um on um on on uh, strategies for k-12 school openings i think is what they called it or something along that line uh, i don't have it in front of me i apologize but uh, they issued it friday afternoon um and so of course with the three-day weekend getting everybody together to kind of assess that has been difficult and challenging for the state as well the state superintendent did call a, a call for this morning to uh, begin looking at the guidance and just having some initial conversation. So I thought I'd just do a fast overview of what we can, um, best we can tell from our first run here is what's in the guidance. Um, and then talk a little bit more about what I know from the state superintendent's call this morning, what some of the outstanding questions are, and then where um, we're leaning at this moment. So the guidance, uh, what the guidance says, bottom line continues to be K-12 schools should be the last settings to close after all other mitigation measures in the community have been employed and the first to reopen when they can do so safely. That's kind of their guiding principle. Consistent with the current approach, the guidance specifically states that decisions should be guided by information on school specific factors, such as mitigation strategies implemented, local needs, stakeholder input, the number of cases among students, teachers, and staff, and school experience with safely reopening. In other words, while these are recommendations, there are other factors that need to be considered. Those are, those are quotes from the guidance. Schools that are already open can stay open with strong mitigations in place. That's in the guidance. The, the same two measures of community burden, um, percent positivity and case incidents, are recommended while acknowledging, and this is a quote, the transmission level for any given location will change over time and should be reassessed weekly for situational awareness and to continuously inform planning. That is one change the, DO, the DOE talked about today. It was a seven-day look instead of a 14-day look at your, at your numbers. Um, it does appear that the CDC is looking at the metrics a little bit differently. We're, we're working to better understand their metrics. We do know, um, regardless of how you're looking at the metrics, we are currently in high transmission for the VDH measures and the CDC's uh, metrics. The same uh, five key mitigation strategies for mitigating COVID-19 transmission in schools to continue to be emphasized. That's the correct use of masks, physical distancing, hand washing and respiratory etiquette, cleaning and maintaining your facilities, and contact tracing in collaboration with the local health department. And then just an additional reminder for you all, in addition to those five strategies, I'd also note we've implemented the COVID safety teams as we discussed at our last meeting as another layer of support. 
to ensure those mitigations are in place. The guidance says that schools should adopt the key mitigation strategies to the largest extent practical that a, later, that a layered approach is essential. Regarding physical distancing, for example, their guidance has always been continues to be six feet to the greatest extent possible, but I, but I will note in this new guidance, there is a caveat that six feet is required when local health metrics are substantial or high. And there's a chart that I have and I'll, I'll give you all um, um, that talks a little bit about that. Guidance also notes that cohorting and physical barriers may continue to be used as alternatives when physical distancing is not always feasible. Links are provided for a lot of the same research that has already been shared with the board and that confirms, and this is a quote, there's evidence to suggest that K-12 in-person school attendance is not a primary driver of community transmission. And the guidance continues to repeat that younger students are less likely to have uh, risk of in-school transmission due to in-person learning than older students, middle and high. Regarding shifting between in-person and virtual instruction, the new guidelines acknowledge that Despite careful planning and consistent implementation of mitigation, some situations may occur that lead school officials to consider temporary closing schools or parts of a school, such as a class or a grade level to in-person instruction. These decisions should be made based on careful considerations of a variety of factors and with the emphasis on ensuring the health and wellness of students, families, teachers, and staff. New to the guidelines is an emphasis on diagnostic and screening surveillance testing uh, screening or surveillance testing of students and staff with the suggestion that testing could be offered by referral to community-based testing sites through collaboration with local public health or through a centralized test location offered by the school district. Also new is a mention of prioritizing educators for vaccinations, although they then specifically state access to vaccination should not be considered a condition for reopening schools for in-person instruction. Also new to the guidance is a statement that athletics and extracurricular activities should only occur virtually in high transmission that she, and that she should only happen outdoors with substantial transmission that even in moderate or low transmission, six feet and masks are required. Finally, the new guidelines emphasize that we're in this for the long haul as, as we, we know. Even after teachers and staff are vaccinated, schools need to continue mitigation measures for the foreseeable future, including requiring masks in school and physical distancing. So after a call with the state superintendent this morning, here's a little bit more about what we know. Generally, the message from VDOE this morning was that the last guidance from VDH on, um, VDH on January 14th is the current guidance we need to follow. No new guidance from the Department of Health, Virginia Department of Health is anticipated certainly before the end of the week. And school divisions should feel comfortable with current planning until and unless we receive new guidance from VDH. We also were told that we do anticipate that VDH will be reviewing and potentially aligning their metrics that they currently report with the CDC metrics that are linked in the new guidance. When asked directly about whether or not school divisions that had some schools open and were in the process of opening more schools, which is, as you probably know, common right now across the Commonwealth given the governor's March 15th orders uh, or guidance, um, could those schools continue or would they need to roll back given the six feet requirement? And it was indicated that school divisions who had any schools open successfully could continue to move forward. The state superintendent quoted a CDC clarification which stated that while the CDC recommends six feet of physical separation, school leaders may use the information in the CDC guidance and apply local contextual factors to make decisions based on what is working well and what needs to be adjusted to strengthen mitigation in their own communities and schools. The recommendation and the guidance are not intended to require schools to, this is a quote from the CDC, the recommendations and the guidance are not intended to require schools to close or restrict in-person learning for those schools that are already providing in-person instruction, either hybrid or full in-person. It was also stated this morning that as always in this process, CDC guidance alone shouldn't be used to determine whether or not we open schools, but should be used along with guidance from the VDH and importantly with local data concerning school impact based on our ability to mitigate which is consistent with the information that we've been getting from VDH and from the governor's office. Regarding testing, if this is something that we want to do, we need to let the state know for planning purposes. Um, this has not, um, just as a reminder, until Friday been recommended by the CDC. So again, we don't yet have any guidance on that from the VDH. From the VDH should be noted that testing doesn't substantially alter recommendations around opening schools in this new guidance, but it is suggested as an additional public health mitigation that should not be used alone, but in combination with other mitigation components to reduce risk of transmission in schools. 
Regarding athletics, it was noted this morning that the VHSL is currently reviewing the guidance and has made no recommendations to member schools. So some of the outstanding questions that I'm left with, uh, we don't know yet what new VDH or VDOE guidance will look like based on these new recommendations from the CDC. We don't know the precise impact on how we would go to school should we follow these recommendations as written without understanding local context. We do believe we would have to substantially alter elementary school schedules and middle school schedules and would have to do more investigation around high school impact. We do not have recommendations yet from the VDH around testing processes or protocols. The division will need to decide if the challenges associated with testing provide any additional benefit and we would need to understand if this would be a school division process or a public health driven process. We do not yet have, as noted, any recommendations from the VHSL. So that's sort of what we have gleaned from the guidance. That's what we heard this morning from conversation with the state superintendent. So here's what we're thinking right now. We are moving in the right direction. We have safely opened schools given local context, which includes our ability to contact, trace, quarantine, and keep schools open. We remain confident, I remain confident, we can continue to do that at all levels and our data supports this. As you all know, while we're seeing cases, we're still not seeing significant transmission in our schools. Our contact tracing is allowing us to quarantine and make good decisions about closing classrooms and not schools, and we've gotten no feedback from public health that our mitigation practices are not working. I've got an op-ed that I shared with some folks over the weekend from researchers out of Harvard and Boston University who challenged some of the guidance and point to what we already know, which is that the science supports our approach. And I'll just, the reason I bring it up is because we've talked so much about the science that drove our decision to open our schools. And I want to just quote for you what they wrote. They, they, they pointed out, community spread metrics pose major problems. We're part of a group of faculty and researchers at Harvard, Boston, and Brown University that released a report in July using such metrics as indicators for when to open schools. But we changed our position on this. You all will recognize that, changing our position on that. In light of overwhelming scientific evidence that transmission within schools can be kept low regardless of community spread so long as good mitigation measures are in place. It's also clear that community spread is not an indicator of within school transmission. The CDC itself released a study showing this. It also recently wrote that there's little evidence that schools have contributed meaningfully to community transmission. So why tie reopening schools to community spread? They also noted the CDC emphasizes maintaining six feet of distancing even between kids, but that ignores the science on children transmission and the power of layered risk reduction measures. Why? Because with masks, distancing is important, but not the key factor determining risks. Ultimately, this six foot distancing rule is what will keep most kids out of school simply because of space limitations. If you all remember the Swiss cheese model that we showed and then some masking data that we shared from the Mayo Clinic, that's really what they're talking about. If you're wearing masks, you can be closer than six feet. That's what the science is saying. That's what these researchers are saying. And then finally, they, they note the blanket ban on sports in red zone communities lacks nuance. Many sports can be played safely uh, with good controls in place, even if community spread is high. So uh, another reason I feel like we're moving in the right direction, comments from the state superintendent support it. Specifically, as I said, it was stated that no new guidance from VDH is anticipated before the end of the week, and we should feel comfortable with current planning unless we receive something new from VDH. The current guidance has been all along from the VDH and the DOE to physically distance with at least three feet, and we've been doing that. In addition, when asked directly whether or not school divisions that had some schools open were in the process of opening more schools could continue or would need to roll back, it was indicated, as I said before, that school divisions who had schools opening successfully could continue to move forward. So with that, I'm recommending at, for, that we proceed with our current plan. We're slated to have students back in school next week in grades 7 through 12. We already have students back in grades pre-K through 6 and that we proceed and not disrupt the students who are currently in school or the plans to bring students back next week. I'm recommending we do that with continued monitoring of our data and our mitigation practices, including physical distancing of at least three feet and six feet where feasible. I'm recommending that we continue to assess school level impact and our ability to minimize transmission in our schools as we make decisions about closing classrooms or if needed individual schools, but that we would work to continue to keep all of our other schools open for in-person instruction for those families who've chosen it. I wanna just quickly address athletics with athletics. 
I also think similarly, we've been able to demonstrate during the winter season that our mitigations and monitoring worked with the overwhelming majority of our teams being able to compete and complete the compressed season. So I'm recommending that we proceed as planned with fall sports, particularly given most of these sports are outdoor sports. And we do that with close monitoring of the impact on our programs and close monitoring of that impact on our schools. And I would just wrap up saying, of course, we would share any new guidance that we get from the VDH the VDOE or the VHSL that might have any additional bearing on that conversation. So short version is that's what the guidance says. That's what we've learned from VDOE and and that I believe we're on track um, and we're doing the right thing. We have with local context of our ability to contact trace, to quarantine, to monitor, that we should stay the course here and bring our students back um, 7 through 12 is planned next week and, and keep our students in who are already back. So that's uh, that's what I've got for you, and I'm certainly happy to answer questions. Thank you, Dr. Spence. And I see we have a uh, welcome to some of our uh, Department of School Leadership staff here, and I assume you're here. <laughs> I assume you're here to help with maybe any questions. The, so they that, are, and I'll state that that's not a position I'm standing on alone. We had a long conversation this morning, a very long conversation this morning about this guidance, and the entire leadership team was firmly behind that recommendation. Okay. All right, so we have Mr. Smith, uh, middle schools, Miss Woodhouse High Schools, Miss Lewis Elementary, and of course, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Robertson, our chief of schools officer and so thank you all for being here all right who wants to begin colleagues miss owens thank you um i have a couple questions as always uh in in regards to the uh, superintendent's update uh about vdh not anticipating any um, changes in their guidance before the end of this week. Uh, does that imply that we are expecting an update, it's just planned to be later in the month, or that we have no reason to anticipate an update at this point? No, I, I'm certain the VDH will address the new guidance. I, I just don't know what that will look like. Um, you know, the CDC's guidance, for example, like the big change here is that they put a chart out and they said six feet is required. Mm -hmm. And they've not said six feet is required before because they haven't provided a chart before that says this is exactly what you should do or shouldn't do, um, which is, you know, quite frankly, a little frustrating after a year of wrestling with this conversation. Um, that said, they've never wavered. This, the CDC has always said six feet. They've mm -hmm. always said six feet is the distance. But the VDH and the VDOE and their guidance have always said three feet is okay. So they, they know the six feet has always been the CDC's recommendation, and they have consistently supported school divisions being able to open with three feet because of all the other mitigations that school divisions can put in place. So I say that to say I don't know, I can't predict what they will say relative to this new guidance. I do know it did sound like um, from the state superintendent that one thing they would be doing for sure is realigning their metrics because the CDC has a new set of metrics. So they now have like uh, four instead of five categories and it's like red, yellow, blue, and orange. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you'll probably see the CDC realign their metrics to that. Um, excuse me, the VDH realign their metrics to that. What other guidance they will provide us, I, I can't predict. But yeah, it, uh, he, he said for sure we shouldn't anticipate anything by the end of this week because they're just getting it as well. Sure. Um, one of the things that I uh, am hoping uh, we can continue to discuss and kind of nail down a little bit is the definitions on uh, successful for transmission rates, et cetera. Um, when we, you know, look at our uh, sports, um, most of our teams were able to finish the uh, season. And I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that I understand and that parents and, and the community will all be on the same page for our measures of success. If our measure is being able to finish the season, if our measure is more than 15% of faculty or staff infected or 
quarantined or, or where those, what, what those standards are, maybe not with a precise number, but within a range of what, what our goals are and what success looks like for us? So I don't have any plans to offer you a range or any precise numbers that say this is a success metric if we you know get above x percentage because what we've said every time is we work with the health department to understand whether or not it's working and if the health department says to us that's not working you need to shut that down then that's what we would do and that hasn't occurred so that's how we would define success that we are able to continue to to offer these opportunities we're able to do so with close monitoring and with the appropriate mitigations in place that we've described, athletics and also school, and that the health department has not come to us and said, you can't do that. You've got to shut it down. It's not working. The burden is too high. The transmission is too great. And so I don't, there isn't a range. It doesn't exist. We would be making it up. It would be arbitrary. And I'd rather not do that. I'd rather focus on our continued partnership with the health department and making sure that they're comfortable with what we're doing. And I, I guess maybe clarification um, from the health department would be helpful um, as we move forward with the, the um, looking at this new guidance to understand if that's their intention, if, if it's their intention to say we're going to monitor and we will be the ones to tell you it is not working, shut it down, or if if they say that's not their, their role exactly, that their role will always be, let me tell you how to make it safer, let me tell you how to better mitigate it, it would be helpful to hear that they are going to be able to or willing to say, we'll shut it down when it comes to this point and maybe to hear from them what their standards are that they would be looking at to make those decisions because it would be nice just to have an understanding of what is actually being looked at, what the metrics are that are being considered um, for the tipping point of when something is too dangerous or when it's okay. Um, so, yeah. so I think we can ask them that. I mean, they certainly in our conversations about opening school were very clear. Dr. Lindsay was very clear with me. Uh, yes, as long as I could say to you, this needs to shut down and you're willing to shut it down, then this is how this will work. And I've and of course, my answer was yes. Of course, that's why we have this partnership. We rely on that advice. I don't. I can't speak to if the new guidance changes that for them, but we can certainly uh, inquire. We've got Mary has a really good uh, meeting going every week now with their team. We have dedicated staff from the health department who are working with us, and so we certainly can speak to them and talk to them about that and see if we can get them available to come talk with you all. Okay. And can I do one more? Okay. Um, I'm very interested in uh, moving forward or, or further exploring a testing screening uh, component uh, for our schools, particularly because I believe that we will be dealing with this for, for some time, not just till the end of the school year. Uh, and so uh, I know that you know, some other districts, not necessarily locally, have uh, utilized testing screening that perhaps uh, private schools locally may be able to give us um, experience or uh, tips on the use of the testing and screening, but I, I wanted to find out if we are taking any steps to start exploring what that would look like or how that could be used. So no to your last question because we just got the guidance and testing literally has not been mentioned until Friday is something. I mean, it was actually specifically mentioned all the way up until Friday is something that was not necessary to do. And and so this is a 180 degree turnaround uh, two days ago, three days ago. So uh, no, we have not started any exploratory conversations. What I've asked is for Mary to review the guidance on testing and to come back with some thoughts and recommendations on whether or not we should pursue that. See, what you have to consider when you think about testing is, is the lift on that, because it's a heavy lift to do testing. If the lift on that provides you any benefit in terms of your understanding of your ability to stay open. So I need her to look at that, work with the health department to assess that, because up until now, the answer from the CDC has been no. And now they're saying, well, you can do it as an additional layer of mitigation to help identify where there might be cases in the community, but it isn't clear that it 
provides you much information in terms of whether or not schools should be open. And if you look at their charts, there isn't a substantive difference. They, so they have they actually have in the guidance a chart that says, if you're not testing this, if you are testing this, and there isn't any substantive difference between those two charts. So the I, we have to get more information. It's the short answer. And we will. Mary has, Mary has already sent me a list of the key points from the document and uh, key questions that she has that she needs to get answers to. Okay, that, um, that is my primary uh, concerns for now. Uh, I was looking at a, a study of a school that uh, was conducting uh, universal testing and it looked like as much of as much as 80% of the positive tests that they found in their school were asymptomatic uh, results found through their universal testing. Uh, and so I, I think that they're, it's definitely worth a continued conversation, particularly if our uh, standard as to whether we are successful in this is uh, transmission within the school. And if we are having a better uh, a better way to judge whether we are avoiding transmission in the school or, or the rate that we're seeing it at. And I think that's important. Okay, thank you. Colleagues? Madam Chair, uh, Ms. Franklin has her hand raised. Okay, is that you, Ms. Franklin? Yes, I'm sorry. Yep. It is. Um, I just want to personally congratulate and thank uh, the administrators, the teachers, everybody, uh, Ms. Shaw, I mean, everybody involved. I, I've only heard, personally heard, uh, positive feedback about how everything has, has gone since the reopening. And I, I know that there have been so many hours put into this and so much planning and, you know, um, thought. And I just want to congratulate all of you involved who have done this successfully and done such a great job. Um, I mean, just the overwhelming feedback that I get personally from from the people that I speak to with kids in school and um, you know and the parents and and the teachers as well um, have just said that it has just been um, overall a very positive experience so I just want to personally say how proud I am of, it, of all of you um, for making that happen so efficiently and, and so successfully so uh, so thank you for all your hard work okay thank you Uh, if I could throw this out to whichever of you wants to answer in terms of the safety assessment teams from our first two weeks back, and I guess this is more for you, Miss Lewis, though it's sixth grade too, so does that overlap? Uh, do do you get the reports of 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 the teams or who? It's who actually, was... Mr. Freeman's office that deals with this, oh. so he might be able to speak okay. to. Right, I know it's 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 young, it's a new process, and I just thought the public in general could benefit from just you know in, in, a little more information about now that that process is two weeks in the works. Right. So, and to answer your question, they do have access to the spreadsheet where we uh, download information to say here's what occurs. So that information is available. I'm not. Do you want to elaborate any further on the question before I kind of go into a little bit more detail on? Yes. Who who do they report their observations to? I assume the the building principal, but beyond that, where does the information go? Office of Safe Schools. Their Office of Safe Schools is the lead for this mm -hmm. uh, for the assessment teams. So ultimately, all that goes into Safe Schools. But you're right. The important thing is making the connection with the principals when they're complete with the assessment, so that they understand what the conditions in their schools are. And you did note that there, for continuity purposes, at least at this point, the same team would be following up. Is that still the plan for now? That's the goal. Mm -hmm. uh, to the extent and we'll possible. monitor how we can maintain it. Mm -hmm. And the reason that why that was the goal is, and you mentioned the word consistency, so that you know as much as possible, every time that we um, do an assessment, it's building on previous information. So we're this isn't intended to be a, a single point in time. It should be a you started here several assessments ago and be able to see the progress uh, that occurs from there. Sure. And, and Dr. Robertson. We get those reports as well. So I have access to the spreadsheet. My team has access to the spreadsheet. 
uh, we get those updated weekly. Okay, so I think that's important for us all to know. Both, both of your departments are, are monitoring that. Yeah. Thank you. Do any of you have any comments to share with us? <laughs> Since you took... Well, I'll take I'll take the liberty to and I, my entire team is here because sometimes I think it's important that there's another voice at the podium besides me. And so I'm going to ask Miss Lewis to come up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, we do get the reports if that's what you want to hear, and uh, we do follow up with uh, particular schools. If we see something that's really standing out that we know we need to go and have a conversation with that principal, we will do that. As a matter of fact, I have two schools now that I have to visit just to make sure they tighten up on some things that we've seen on the assessment sheet. Okay? And Ms. Lewis, could you speak? I don't mean to put you too much on the spot here, but I rarely do it. I know you can handle it. Um, could you just speak a little bit to the conversation this morning when we were talking about, you know, if we if we yeah. had to alter the elementary student schedule at this stage? Exactly. I told him my stomach was turning, basically, because, you know, we're doing so well. And I did make this statement that I was speaking for elementary principals. Then I thought about it. Oh. So I pulled a group of elementary principals <laughs> together uh, this afternoon, and I said, if we had to alter our plans, and the first thing they said was, it'll be a nightmare. Yeah. Please stay the course. Stay the course, please. We're doing so well. We have our groups, our reading groups, our RI groups, our PALS groups. One principal even said, my PALS scores and my RI scores are soaring. Don't mess with it. Let's just stay the course. We're doing well. We have the mitigation strategies in place. You know, they hadn't had any concerns from parents, and they felt that they would have had some concerns from parents by now since we've been back for two weeks, and parents seem, seem to have been happy with everything. They even said their entire schedules would have to change if we didn't stay the course. So they want to stay the course, and we understand the importance of all the safety mitigations, and we are going to continue to monitor that and do the best that we can to keep all of our students and our staff safe. Thank you. Thank uh -huh. you, Ms. Lewis. You're welcome. I'm going to add one thing that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing, and that is this. We have more families calling school saying they want their kids changing from option two to option one. So our wait list is growing. And I, that, that's a good thing. And that parent, it's indicating that parents have trust in what we're doing in schools and they want their kids back in that environment. It's a bad thing and we, we, we can't fit another kid in the classroom. You guys continue to get emails from parents who desperately want their kids in school. We can't create more space within buildings. And so it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. So and is it and is it fair to say mass compliance at this level would in the first week or two was was among the biggest challenge and I'm not to, not to suggest an overriding concern but it, among all the mitigation factors or or what was the what is your overall assessment of that Miss Lewis? little babies they keep those masks on I happened to be at four or five schools on Friday and I was observing in PE and I was amazed at the little ones who you know had their mask on so that has not been been an issue sometimes with the little ones is keeping them apart because they're little mm -hmm. you know it's like herding cats sometimes mm -hmm. but you know just keeping that distance and teachers and principals having to constantly remind them of that. But as far as the mask, not seeing that as an issue. 
not systemically. No, so, uh, no. Uh, you know, you know you and, and it stands it. to, re and it's no surprise that we do hear from uh, some teachers, and, and hopefully Correct. they're working through that, and, and hopefully maybe too with the parent. Uh, Correct. The parent Correct. can't be with the child. But, Correct. Um, and everything in elementary school is a learning experience. We have to teach, and that's what we do. We model and teach for kids. Okay? Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, last call for colleague questions or comments. Yes, Ms. Owens. Thank you. Um, I think just so that we know where we're looking moving ahead, uh, at a previous meeting, there were uh, questions, I think, from Ms. Weems, she's virtual, but about uh, when we could look at just bringing all the children back into the schools full time. And uh, I believe the response was along the lines of, we need to wait and see what the CDC says. We can't make those decisions without, uh, we can't go against their standards for the decisions. Um, is our, I guess our hard point, the VDH standards, the CDC standards, or just a um, amalgamation of, of different standards, of, just so that we know where we're looking for moving forward? Okay. I, and I appreciate the question. I don't think I said it was the C, anything about the CDC standards. I said I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball in terms of what's going to happen down the road, but I haven't seen any changes to the guidance that we have. So I was in that scenario referring to the guidance that we've been using all along, which is that three feet is acceptable, six feet where, pop, where it's feasible, three feet where it's not. And we are sticking to that. So right now, unless VDH and VDOE radically change their guidance, I'm recommending we stay the course with three feet and keep keep on the path we're on. In terms of the question about foreseeable future, I think we, I don't anticipate that guidance changing anytime soon, assuming it doesn't change with this new, new guidance here, and that we should stay the course with that guidance until such time as we're told it's safe for children to be back together, all of us to be back together without that physical distancing requirement. That That's the kind of key separator right now in terms of bringing more students back is that physical distancing requirement. So we're, we're sort of, as Don just mentioned, we're at the max out on how many students we can bring back into our buildings currently based on that physical distancing requirement, and that is at three feet. Okay, and I think it, it was probably a, a misspeak at the time then, because it was, I was looking at the video, but um, if that helps clarify that it's the VDH slash VDOE guidance that they are putting out, that that is what we will um, continue to align our plan to. Got it. Thank you. Mrs. Anderson. So this is uh, for Mr. Freeman, I guess, I'm assuming, because it has to do with bus drivers. So um, if a student... Um, is being quarantined and will not be in school for what is it 14 days they have to stay out for quarantining purposes uh or whatever whether whether they're being quarantined for for a certain amount of time or whether they have covid whatever are the bus drivers told why that student is not riding the bus for that amount of time are you communicating to the bus drivers if a student um either has covid or in other words, if, if a student normally rides the bus, are the bus drivers being told? Because I, I think they were like, I, I got some, some messages from bus drivers and they were concerned that they'd like to be in the loop. Is that some kind of a conflict that you can't let them know? Or could you explain that a little bit? Um, so this one will require a little bit of research on it. So is the suggestion that... Uh, on every bus driver if some child doesn't come to school based on either a COVID diagnosis or um, for COVID. Some other, or COVID basically if they're being quarantined or if they have COVID and um, I, th I think the bus drivers they want to be in the loop if if the child has been you know if they're they're quarantined due to COVID so I'll, I'll, I'll circle back and coordinate with our health professionals to ensure that we're in line with that. There, there are some concerns, as you know, that we don't share 
right. everybody who has had a COVID diagnosis. Right. But the uh, bus drivers, I think they feel like, well, you know, they. So, so my, my reply was, you know, well, I think the CDC guidelines are, are that if, if you've been exposed to someone for 15 minutes or more, close isn't contact. that correct? Close contact, 15 so, minutes. Right. So if you're a close weeks. contact, the Department of Health will notify you you're a close contact. Right. We can't tell them a child is at home with COVID because that would be a violation of HIPAA. Their, well, FERPA for us. Oh, but okay. Right, so, so there's some I, overlap between you know us. I basically it's FERPA for us. said to the bus driver, you know, well, a, a child might walk past you, they may have COVID, but they've got a mask on and they weren't around you for 15 minutes just because they walked past you. That was my response back to the bus driver, but I just wanted to know how that's being handled. Our bus driver's being told. The other one has to do with, uh, um, and this is this is maybe Dr. Robertson, maybe you could answer this. And this is just for clarification purposes, because I know that next week we start with our secondary school students going to school. And we've had some emails from parents who want to know why they only get to go two days. And I know the reason why, but I didn't answer it. I just left it to our chair. But for clarification purposes, for our audience who may be listening, could you go over that one more time while we're doing just two days a week for secondary students? and? and just clarify that, please. It's, it's physical distancing limitations in the classroom. Right. Otherwise, we couldn't do it. I mean, if we brought everybody back. Correct. We could, we, the best we can do is two days per week. Right. Okay. Our capacity. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, this is Melnick. I, I just want to thank you guys for, for being here. And I just want to make it clear to the public that um, while our intention is to move forward, it doesn't negate the fact that that we, we have teachers who are afraid of COVID and rightly so, because we don't know if we get COVID, how we may be affected by COVID. What, you know, we may have no symptoms um, and, and we all know how terrible it can be. And it's really imperative for us as board members and as, as members of this community that we recognize that and um, that I, just just thank you for 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 emphasizing um and what we're doing um and and what matters and and just reminding our teachers that we're grateful for them being there and for pressing forward with us and um that we support them and i i just think it's really important to remind ourselves of that um because as an adult i am i am afraid of covid and i limit my activities and and, and I know it's scary, but thank you. Thank you to our, uh, our teachers and um, all of our employees in our buildings. And I'll just add to that, I referred back to our original fall reopening plan, the hard copy, and right on the front page in Dr. Spence's introductory paragraph, so this dates back to last summer, it said, you know, throughout this process, the health and safety of our students, staff and families will remain a priority and I've tried most recently to, to, to convey that, to say the fact that we're, they're not mutually exclusive, we're moving forward, but that still, that is still remains a, a priority. Um, and, and that, hence, that's where all the effort has, has, has been devoted to. And it is a process and we, we're, it's not, we're not perfect, but we're getting better. I, I feel hopefully at this point, it's more clear to both constituencies who they're to reach out to with questions or concerns you know we're reminding parents of, of the usual process of please uh, share your observations or concerns with your principal as a as an initial step teachers it's my understanding have been given their own instruction on outreach to uh, to safe schools recognizing their unique place and in, in the in all of this so you know hopefully that, that will continue to to uh, to solidify more moving forward too, because we do all recognize that that this is an ongoing process. So I just wanted to say that, Miss Owens. Just wanted to um, just put it on the radar uh, and see if there was a time frame for when we as a board may be discussing what next school year will look like if these. Uh, 
parameters stay in place. I think that there is a high likelihood that in September we will still have the distancing uh, situation. And, you know, we started off this school year telling parents and families that go ahead and make a decision. This is going to be for the first semester and then we'll go from there. And I think, uh, as Dr. Robertson pointed out, that he's hearing families interested in changing. And so what that might look like for next school year and how we're going to determine, you know, we had the issue with the possible lottery and the, the concerns that people had about that uh, this year. And so I don't want us to wait uh, too long because I'm sure it's going to be a, a major undertaking. Sure. Uh, it, right. And so I actually, we had that conversation this morning, as a matter of fact, and I actually asked our docile team to start mapping backwards for us on when we thought we needed to come to the board to talk about some things that we think need to happen next year. Um, for example, like looking at the virtual learning center, whether or not that needs to continue, but also what's our time frame mapping backwards in terms of building out schedules, understanding various scenarios. So I, I don't think to your specific question, I can come to you and say, for what it will look like next year in this in you know because it's you're likely it's likely to be like this i think what we're going to have to do is some similar to what we had to go through last year is look at some scenario based planning if the guidance looks like this then this is what we're going to do and this is our map for getting to there if the guidance changes and it looks like this because of vaccinations or whatever it is and it looks like this then we're going to map from there and we'll come to you with a couple of scenarios and, and talk about those but I don't have a timeline on that. I've got a map backwards from the scheduling process. Okay. I believe we are ready to adjourn. So uh, I, I call for meeting adjournment. Thank you all. Yeah, yeah.